Check, check, check. Hey, Matt, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Yep. Yeah, just we're doing it by alphabetical order. So Alejandro will go first. Right on. Great. Um, and this is Edie. Edie will be Hi, Edie. Um, hey introducing you. Great. Awesome. awesome. Okay. How's it going? Hi, it's v. going well. How are you? How's the first day? Hi, Jay. Great. Good first day. Good. V, you know Matt. Yes. Hi, V. We we, uh, we co uh, led a, a, a residency workshop yeah. um, a few years ago. Yep. Nice to see you. Nice seeing you. So, so once. Oh, hey, Alejandro. Hello. Hey, you're going to you're going to go first. Sounds good. Jubilat. Jubilat. Okay. I'll welcome everybody and then I will introduce you. Okay. I think sort sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sort of. Harvey. Hi, Alejandro. Nice to see you again. Hey, Matt. Nice to see you again, too. Good luck, everyone. Likewise. See, there's our YouTube screen. That's the YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's in a delay. Yeah. Um, Pause for me to even notice. <laughs> yeah, see it. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jay Ponteri, and I am the director of PNCA's Low Residency Creative Writing Program. Welcome to Summer Residency 2023. Yay. I am so excited. Um, I wanted to give you all a heads up um, that we will be doing a land acknowledgement for the residency tomorrow morning before um, V's talk. Um, so if you can jump on the Zoom at 8.55, that would be great and we'll get started. And V's talk will be um, around nine o'clock. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies writing fellow, Edie Guy, who will be doing the introductions. All right. First, we have Alejandro de Acosta reading. Um, Alejandro is a teacher, writer, and translator, still in no particular order. 
His most recent teaching includes private tutoring in literature and philosophy. His most recent writing includes a manuscript of poems and a novel, finally, his words. His most recent translations include poems by Macedonio Fernandez, Alberto La Seca, and Paulo de Holly. Alejandro lives in Gainesville, Florida. Please welcome Alejandro. Thank you. I'm going to read a uh, part of a chapter of uh, a novel I'm working on that uh, doesn't yet have a title. In the Fenimore prefecture, the skies were always gray. It took a while to scry out the dark firmament behind that everlasting gray sheet. Even on a rare sunny day, the gray was nearby or managed to assert itself. I recall that first day meeting some young people out in the field around the tower. The field was a square of asphalt, but it had a fountain and people gathered there as if from ancient memory, as if it were not a fountain, but a spring, as if the field were cool and shaded on a hot day, as if the tower were a holy mountain. I'd spent a year living more or less underground. I lived in a row house basement with strange people. I didn't have much of a plan. I tried reading some philosophy books I found in a library attic, but nothing made sense. It was all too old, too antiquated, like learning a dead language. I also studied some works of psychonautics, but felt the need for company. Reading alone did not seem to generate any hallucinations. And the people that surrounded me were directionless. It seemed the same was increasingly true for me. Through the network, I managed to locate a document claiming there were psychonautic meetings in another industry, 596. I, under, I undertook the procedures and protocols to change prefectures. And soon enough, I was facing a tower under gray skies. A tall man, awkwardly yet assertively, inserted himself between my gaze and the tower. So uh, as I was saying, he began, or rather seemed to continue in a nervous tone. I'd not only not been speaking with him, I'd never seen him before. Uh, shouldn't we look into who is really at the top of the tower? It seemed he had a bit of an accent. No one has the keys, came a monotone from a significantly shorter man, squat and swart with a round face. No one can get up there by stairs or elevator. The tall man introduced himself with clumsy politeness as Ram El Zay. The short one was Ram Ruhr. They went on discussing the tower, comparing it with an even taller tower in the capital city of the prefecture. That faraway tower was home to all sorts of scientific and cultural experiments, completely detached from the purposes of industry, secret and probably very dangerous affairs, affairs people like us knew very little about. The two went on discussing something having to do with city planning and the list music, in which locations and cities were identified for resonant purposes. But I was no longer paying attention. I was entranced by the tower. I'd yet to go up, but I understood from a brochure and gossip that all meetings in this industry happened in that tower between the 30th and 88th floor. The elevators went up to the 99th, but those top 11 floors were said by some and this was not in any brochure, to be empty and dusty, not as if they had never been used, but as if they had been suddenly abandoned. There were many other people down in that field. Some were preparing for meetings and some were milling about. I met some scruffy looking young people who shared a photocopied stapled pamphlet of exotic reading, a cannibalist nature cult that stocked guns and explosives in some dark ghetto compound somewhere in time and space. The sort of place you walk by shuddering. What was their interest in this, I asked. In their plain clothes and gentle abandon that seemed miles away from this sort of militancy. Well, they had the same diet as us, one said. Cannibalism? I blurted out. No, they were vegetarians. The cannibalism was a political gesture of decolonization. What is decolonization? I asked. They both said it at once. It is not a metaphor. This suggested to me that decolonization was indeed some kind of metaphor, but a very convoluted one. I thanked them from their pages and wandered off. 
An earnest, agitated man in a beige robe intercepted me on the way to the doors of the tower. He spoke to me about his religion. He asked me to think about death. He said to picture a bomb strapped to my leg that could go off at any time. I asked him what that added to how we think about death. He hesitated, so I made a leap for the doors. I was inside the tower. The great hall I had plunged into smelled of industrial carpet, that smell that never goes away, drugstores and lobbies. Inside the hall, a small crowd was gathered around two elevator doors on the far end. I decided to take the stairs. There was indeed a doorway that led to a stairwell more poorly lit than the great hall, orangish light rather than bright white fluorescence. I had 32 floors, so I began climbing. At around the third, a young man passed me in exercise clothes. He was running up the stairs. I took the time to recite to myself a poem by August Strom, one line per step. Space or room, time, space, due to space, direct, space, time, space. Stretch, unite, increase, space, time, space, turn, fight, say space, time, space, struggle, throw, strangle, space, fall, sink, fall, space, time, space, world. Space, time, space, craze. Space, time, space, whirr. Space, time, stray, nothing. Just as I finished, at the ninth or 11th floor, two more young men passed me. I don't know why I called them young. They were no younger than me. I've always been old and young at the same time, and that has governed my capacity for belief. But their outfits and demeanor did seem to radiate a different kind of youth, athleticism and drive. I kept climbing the stairs now two at a time to emulate their sprints. On the 19th floor, for the first time, there was a view to the outside. It was a round hatch. I looked out into the fields of the prefecture and spent a while on the horizon line. I rested my eyes on that horizon. Out of the contrast between brown earth and gray skies, I thought I saw a dim light emerging, as if there had been a cloud break, not anywhere nearby, but enough for a beam or ray to shoot out over the brown earth and strike the side of the tower and here another pair of youths jogged past me. I smelled their sweat. I kept climbing. On the 14th floor, I found some graffiti. Someone had written, I am a psychonaut. And under it, another hand responded, I am a historian. To the side, much larger in another hand, read Menard, exclamation point, underline. I struggled to remember, who was Menard? I finally made it to the designated floor and emerged from the stairwell only to be surrounded by a talkative group exiting the elevator. The first to catch my attention was Diana, dark brown hair and tawny skin, dressed for warmer weather than the day called for. I know I don't look like these others, she said. I'm of the Mediterranean race. We are ancient. What are you? Probably the same, I said. I did put Mediterranean into a form once or twice. And yet I've never been. I don't care about the world island or its peripheries. There are other seas nearby of greater concern, even to me. That's why I'm here. I think psychonautics may show the way, but I'm not sure that it can be taught. At this point, Ram El Zay and Ram Roar from the field below reappeared. I again noted that Ram Roar talked like a robot, a very friendly robot. I looked more closely at Ram El Zay, lighter of tone, skinny and awkward, almost fragile. He did speak with an accent and I now noted sometimes a stutter. The duo wanted help assembling a piece of office furniture, a grid of mail slots. We looked around and there were no hammers. I wandered out of the room into a custodial closet. There was a lock on the door, but it had been left unlocked. So I pushed my way in. I looked around, no hammers. No tools of any sort, no custodial implements either. There was a large tank attached to an air distribution pipe. The tank, as well as several canisters stacked to the side, all read TRIO NOL-902. I figured I would need to look into that. As for assembling the mail cabinet, fortunately it could be done with a lot of pushing and pulling, shoving wood slats into each other. There was a window in the meeting room and I saw snow outside. I remembered snow in dreams and snow in distant prefectures. When I turned back from my distraction, the other three had assembled the thing. 
It towered over us and took up most of the cramped room. Ram Ruhr was busy placing adhesive labels with the names of the participants. Diana came in with a large basket of mail and began placing envelopes in mail slots. Meanwhile, Ram el made awkward conversation with me. We were packed into a corner of the room as the others moved about the large structure. So, uh, he began, what have you read in psychonautics? Phrased, but not intoned as a question. Mostly Zettel, I answered. Zettel, uh, I prefer Menard. Menard, I thought of the graffiti in the stairwell. And then I remembered, a proponent of political ultraviolence. What could that have to do with psychonautics? And I asked this of the skinny man. Some of us are calling for, he said, and paused to look at me through large glasses that magnified his globular eyes, a reconsideration of violence. This slight man barely seemed able to stand up, and I had noted how quickly he subtracted himself from the physical task of light assembly we had just engaged in. What violence could he possibly be interested in? unless it was a matter of calling for others to do things. I made a mental note to avoid any meeting in which there was a discussion of Menard. The last thing I needed was a psychonautic hallucination of violence. Diana handed me an envelope. Here, she said, this one's for you. My name was misspelled on the envelope, but she was right. I looked at the label on the mail slot, also misspelled, but in a different way. I opened the envelope. It was a form letter to all of us, my name had been added in a sloppy hand, misspelled in yet a third way. It read, one, you are now in a professional environment. Two, the industry's terminals have been connected, but we will use paper for all professional communications. You will soon understand why. I showed Diana the sheet and gestured with a finger to the second point. Do you know what this is about? They're calling it the image plague. Diana's dark eyes met mine for a few moments before the other two broke in with their endless talk. The next day, there was a meeting to launch the other meetings in this industry. Industries depend on meetings, but there are several kinds of meetings. They will tell you that societies run on work or energy or belief, but only the last is true and not in the sense that they think. Societies run on meetings and meetings can focus belief. They can also distort it or take it away. And this was a meeting about meetings. All of us were interested in, all of us interested in psychonautics were there. All of the primes were there. One of them stood up. There was something of a disguised presence about him, as if he had dyed his hair or had plastic surgery or was wearing a very sophisticated mask. Whatever it was made his voice slightly slurred, which added to the strangeness of a long speech that he delivered on the difficulties of studying psychonautics. You will be hungry, he began. You will be sad. You will be confused and look to psychoactive substances for help. You will have visions of your mother giving birth to you. You will experiment on your own bodies. You will develop new illnesses. All the while, you will be, the, you will be in this dark place under gray skies. The water that gathers in a depression nearby is what the ancient sages called an evil pool. As it draws spiritual malaise toward itself, it will pull it over your houses, through your windows, into your very bodies. At night, you will feel it pass through. You may dream of floods or other disasters. Another prime stood up. He seemed a strong country stock, as if he had once been a soldier or at least a brawler. I leaned to one side to check out his ears under his white shock of hair for cauliflower shape as he began, but couldn't make anything out. Do not entirely trust my esteemed colleague, he said in a rough voice. Concerning the dark night of the soul, he says you're about to enter. Psychonautics is a noble pursuit indeed. And he continued his exhortation in this manner. My attention drifted to the gray clouds outside the window. At the end of the second prime speech, my attention was sucked back into the room by a skinny woman with large glasses and short hair. Can you explain, she asked nervously, what is going on with the terminals? The first prime stood back up. Something or someone has flooded the network. They found a way to send pictures. It seems everyone's watching. Everyone's distracted. Our only hope for you is psychonautics. A third prime, a sad-faced Moorish woman, sat in the back and scowled through these two presentations. She said nothing but would sometimes cast looks at the people seated around her, among which was the skinny woman. I didn't know what to think about them. But as to the speeches, was that it? Psychonautics versus the image plague? <clears throat> 
I went to many meetings and did my best to avoid the political ones. No Menard, no violence. I already knew that way was madness. And yet more and more of the primes seem to be calling for political approaches. And every political approach, despite whatever else was called for, was a clamor for violence. Yes, the calling for had followed me to this new industry or horrible thought I had followed it. That was my first lesson in this industry. Avoid the in-mixture of politics and psychonautics at all cost. Politics was always the lie in the mixture. I wanted to learn about pure psychonautics. Listening to primes, doing my own research into less common areas in the industry library, and finally through gossip and hearsay, I began to assemble an outline of psychonautics. It seemed there were four kinds of psychonauts. Some read the work of past psychonauts, some practiced what they claimed was psychonautics, but no one agreed as to what this was or whether anyone was doing it right. What I had come to know before and what went on here fell under these two headings. Others read literary or religious texts, even scientific texts, usually popularized, and finally some engaged in other practices such as sport or yoga, exotic diets, or tantric sex that they claimed had something to do with psychonautics. Possibly some of the characters in the field were of this sort. Though again, no one agreed as to what the link or relevance was or could be with the ancient ideals. I decided I needed to understand the ancient origins of psychonautics, which most primes only spoke of in elusive or even dismissive terms, as if there had been shame at the origin, pudenda origo, I heard someone say once in a whisper. Supposedly, one of the primes had read a lot about ancient psychonautics. I began going to his meetings and reading about the ancient psychonauts, who, unlike the moderns, had left no writings and were known only through doxographies or their appearances as characters in works of literature or religious documents. It was a little bit like philosophy, though as most of us knew, philosophy had died out sometime before modernity, when the last teacher could find no more students, and the lone students continued their studies, mired in confusion, more and more dissolute, until their writings were incoherent, even to themselves. Psychonautics could at least claim for itself the possibility of two sorts of transmissions, one person to person, as the primes offered in their meetings, the other through study of formulas in written manuals, such as Zettel. Nevertheless, the ancient origins of psychonautics were murky, and the prime who was supposed to know of such things was not of much help. He spoke in a rapid and elusive manner, a barrage of names and places, as if he had memorized it all but had no concern with any of it. No one I met claimed to have ever <laughs> claimed to have ever had any kind of psychonautic experience with him. I certainly never did. One by one, the others stopped going to his meetings and started going to another kind of series, another series headed by a new kind of prime who proclaimed himself a pervert. He was a man who gave the impression of having lived a rough life. At least it seemed he wanted to give that impression with his leather jacket and his many earrings. In what way he was a pervert, he would never make clear, but the key to psychonautic experience he repeated at every meeting was through perversion. I listened to what he said and found it fascinating, but something told me to avoid his glance. Fortunately, he always read from lengthy handwritten notes, and when he extemporized, he would look up at the ceiling. One day he was doing that, staring at the ceiling, and his deep voice took on an unusually sad tone. I want you to be perverts like me, even with me, little smile. But most of you cannot and will never be. Not because of your natures, or capacities, but because of what you do at night. Long pause. He ran his hands over his notebook pages and out onto the table, continued looking up. You're at the terminals, looking at images, and the images are perverse, not any one in particular, all of them together. My perversion is particular, finite, personal, intimate, so as to be psychonautic. The perversion of the images is general, infinite, impersonal, and will worry you all about your bodies before it makes them generic. I once sought to find one of you and ask you to meet my gaze, draw you into psychonautic perversion with me, but now I see that it will never happen. My perversion is my own. My line ends here. My psychonautics is my own. My psychonautics ends here. I went to many other meetings. There was one other prime of note, the quiet Morris from the first meeting. She was always sick. She carried around a pile of books that she never opened or read from, but would sometimes discuss. 
There were some attempts to formulate ideas, but we never got to pure psychonautics. Hospitals are like schools, she said once, and schools are like prisons, and prisons are like industries, so what are we doing here? Several women were crying, and a handsome, muscular man sitting across from me began to grow more and more red with either embarrassment or rage. This always happened. Meetings with the Morris always devolved into crying and sobbing women. One woman would speak and make other women cry. The crying would go on until one of the crying women herself spoke in a heightened tone until the first woman or another began crying and so on. Sometimes someone would bring up psychonautics, but this would always get shut down. I recalled reading at the library about Synanon attack therapy. I told this to Diana, who said yes, but it's also the image plague. I'm not sure why I stayed as long as I did. Eventually, I left. Later, I learned that the Mores was descended from a great poet. I read his works with tremendous interest and treasured a photograph I found on a terminal showing his manly physiognomy, strong jaw and forehead, dark piercing eyes. I wondered what had gone on in that family over the generations. The Mores hated her ancestor, knew nothing about poetry, and was satisfied to hold court over these meetings or crying sessions. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alejandro. Awesome. <laughs> Next up, uh, we have Matt Hart. Um, Matt Hart is the author of Familiar and nine other books of poems. Additionally, his poems, reviews, and essays have appeared or are forthcoming in numerous print and online journals, including American Poetry Review, Big Bell, Conduit, Jubilat, Tenyon Review, Lungful, and Poetry, among others. His awards include a Pushcart Prize, a grant from the Shifting Foundation, and fellowships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference and the Warren Wilson College MFA Program for Writers. He was a co-founder and the editor-in-chief of Forklift Ohio, a journal of poetry, cooking, and light industrial safety from 1993 to 2019. Currently, he lives in Cincinnati, where he teaches at the Art Academy of Cincinnati, co-edits the journal Sorted, and plays in the band Never Knew. Please welcome Matt Hart. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's been a little while since I was able to teach in the program, and uh, I'm glad to be back. I'm going to read some poems. And uh, the last time I was with you, uh, I was working on two lengthy projects, and those have come to fruition at this point. And so I'm back to writing poems every day. Um, so I'm going to read you some every days. And my only parameters are that, you know, I have to uh, write these in a sitting. Uh, and they have to have a beginning and a middle and an end. And um, you know, I revise them uh, quite a lot, but sometimes they expand and contract after the initial um, sitting. But these are these are every days. This first one is called Philosophy. <laughs> Matt Hart is a metal tsunami. Matt Hart is a leaf blower growling through his hair. He depresses into ribbons. He reports the city's dogs. I, who am not him, and everybody else, hope he finds what he's looking for. The correspondence in a peach or a greeting card with some love in it. Perhaps he will concuss less. He thinks he would like to do some good in the world. Often, he leaves a party after only a few minutes and is completely unrecognizable. 
Seldom does he know his own mother. He thinks maybe he is snow and has been. He might be half a chicken or the bladder of a crow. He might be a hummingbird's extendable tongue. Someone should put him under a microscope and see how he's orbited by several broken moons. One of them punches Matt Hart in the nose. He probably deserves it repeatedly. Possibly tomorrow he will be in Alaska or he will be in Cincinnati. And when the parade of him passes, small children will stretch their necks to see. They will stretch so hard and want so much that by the end they will come to resemble giraffes, giraffes in the white pink plumes of pigged roses that come to Matt Hart where he wakes up in pain. It is a downtown day. Letters full of pollen, the stingers of golden bees. Matt Hart gets down on his knees. He kisses his wife Melanie's hand before work. It is only the beginning where he struggles to a cloud. He drives to the store and buys beans to make soup. Everything about this is philosophy. Potentially, anyway. Potentially, anyway, there is more to the presence of the tree limb crews on our street than the way they're cutting around the wires and sapping the trees with their uninspired angling. To be sure, I am not thinking. I am looking seriously and deeply in invisible ways at invisible things, the circulatory systems of the men with their saws and the blood going around inside a closed system and at visible ones, the squirrels with green berries and the robins on the awnings. And it occurs to me in this moment that none of them are thinking, for example, about mitochondria. I mean, I don't know that for certain, but I can be pretty certain or certain enough. And it's obvious that none of them are looking at me, looking at their hearts beating palpably. The men and the squirrels and the robins now flown from the awnings and onto the mailboxes with the red flags up. Mail is outgoing as the air in my lungs. How did I drift into this? Potentially, anyway, I sat up and noticed more than wind in the trees. And I knew it meant something sentimental to me because everything is if one sees it that way. And I do see it that way because that is how I'm wired in the middle of a life for better and worse. And yes, I am okay and I am not okay both. Thanks for asking. But I do, when I can, wish to overflow and bury myself in the azaleas of the next world. Right now, however, I am somewhat content to feel that the other beings I'm watching are also feeling things. Some of them are conscious of this and others probably not, but everything that moves, moves wisely if you watch or if you see it that way. There is something inside us that shows through our motion. I don't know for certain, but I feel pretty sure, or I want to anyway. Sentimental, I squint until my eyes become stars. Potentially, or possibly, I can feel it. So uh, my graduate school mentor, uh, Dean Young, passed away last August, and he had moved to Cincinnati about nine months before that. And we were writing poems back and forth to each other every day. And it was a race in the morning to see who could get the poem sent first. Um, so a lot of these every days I had started writing 
um, some of them were responses to to his work. Um, but uh, every year on the on uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, I try to write uh, a personal poem in the vein of Frank O'Hara or Ted Berrigan. Um, this is the one I wrote this year. It's called Personal Poem Number 11. It has an epigraph from Dean Young. Matt, it's Dean. I'm here. It's 4.31 p.m. in Westwood. And my ears are wildly ringing on New Year's Eve because I just spent the last hour and a half listening to Dean's last voice message to me, which was his first in Cincinnati, frazzled and looking for a beer. The ringing is because I was playing it entirely too loud through a 12-inch Celestian creamback speaker connected to a solid-state Fender Baseman FR-1000 from 1969, the year I was born, the year Americans first kicked up dust on the moon to make it weirder. Dean was 14, and the astronauts were adults, and I was a baby without words, which is still how I sometimes think of myself, even though I'm 53, and I now know a lot of words, including lexical, an esthete, an antithesis, and brule. I'm not ashamed to say I cry a lot, apparently. I have a new credit card offer in my email, which I will ignore. And Rosinia doesn't have a copy of my new book yet, which I will attend to. I never imagined that Dean would be gone into particles and waves just like that at the age of 67, or that I would be writing back and forth in the dark with Mark about poetry and Husker Du and my diabetic terror. Whatever is going to happen is already happening is something Ted Berrigan took from Alfred North Whitehead's metaphysics. But how my repeating it is connected to what came before it, or now after it, i.e. the fact that today Mel can't shake her dream from last night where Bear bit her on the finger, even though he's our dog and soft and has never bitten anyone, is beyond me. Suddenly, I'm also kind of excited. To be cognizant of the fact, though again, I'm not sure why, it's occurring to me this instant that it's not at all improbable that the Bengals will go to the Super Bowl for the second year in a row. Football is serious. Dreams are scary or hilarious or both. Mark will no doubt think there's a randomness to all of this, but let's hear it for Joe Burrow and love. Let's remember Dean falling into the Christmas tree last Christmas. His last Christmas ever at 3127 Manning Ave. Let's consider this meandering recklessness, a walk in the footsteps of the giants of the art and a description of me trying to reckon with a ghost, his voice on a loop, getting beer like a bell. This year, I won't lose anyone. Romanticism. The word was zinc. I thought it was zine. Later, I will add a but to the equation. Dean wanted me to remove a line from the end of my version of Keats's Ode to a Nightingale, so I did that. But then I added these new ones. It all still ends, do I wake or sleep? But now I also wonder if I'm wearing a poly blend with cotton t-shirt or a mink coat. I wonder if the bird on my window ledge has a name other than warbler. When the monster ends up on the glacier and the monster always ends up on the glacier, I imagine a giant frozen teardrop and a small pack of huskies laying around a large fire in a circle. I draw a pentagram in it or an anarchy A. Then I say the magic words and wouldn't you like to know what happens? I float between crying out in anguish or crying out of mirth. 
Everybody's talking about assault weapons these days and capital insurrections and SCOTUS leaking something Arctic. Poor oafish monster. You aren't really much of a monster. Not really much of a poet or a musician or a father or a husband. And to think is to be full of sorrow. Am I a satellite of lifesavers or a pile of dry leaves disheveling in a quiet breeze one or two or three at a time until the pile is only a scattering? Until the mastodon of a monster throws his life upon the pyre of mostly invisible flames, sometimes reportedly bluish or bluish green. Sometimes an elfin maid or a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw coos on dully in disrepair a lot of zzz, 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 which is easy to interpret and kind of difficult to read. Do I glow in the dark or bring the dark with me? Am I the teardrop glacier or the stitches in the monster? How can I reach you so you might understand me, since I'm a confusion that no one may dissolve? The warbler warbling goes off with the leaves. And this is not an ode now that no birds sing. I hope all goes well this morning with the hearts. The dogs huddle closer as the pyre burns low. Am I sidelines or sideburns or sightlines or snow? How does one tie up the loose ends of a life? It can't be done, or it candles, or it candies. The word was zinc, but I thought it was zine. The rioters were shooters, or the shooters were a riot. The star in my body is a long line of shadows, palely loitering or waiting for something, waiting for nothing. The tear ducts empty so the fire expires. Do I wonder or wander? Do I glacier or monster? At the beginning of the ending, do I stare or blink? Land escape painting. I've been in this painting of the grass growing higher than my waist for a while or for a long time or maybe since just now. And I've been hearing random people saying, I can't speak for anybody else before going on to explain how things are for everybody in the landscape of tall grass, which is bordered in a circle by a high cinder block wall, maybe 18 or 33 feet or nine millimeters. And its iridescent smoothness shimmers politically. So it is unscalable, unresolvable, and aesthetically inconsequential. I back up and run at it again and again, banging my saber-toothed cranium against its impenetrable gray rectangles. I've even cracked up a little bit my football helmet with the image of an owl, stuffed inside an image of an owl. Oh, history of human wretchedness. You might say that I have been acting like an asshole or that I am one for not trying harder to assimilate to my parameters. And maybe you could even explain to me the sphincter mechanism and solve the riddle of the sphinx. But still, the problem is in being surrounded mostly by other people with their endless explanations and complaints rather than their moving descriptions of a fat swift breeze blowing through the leaves of a sycamore tree to remake us with cooler heads prevailing in whatever crisis that gobsmacks us next. Like always, however, we are short on descriptions because we don't pay attention or enough of it to make them. I know I'm generalizing, but you know, what I'm talking about. And maybe it's not our fault or all of it. You're busy, etc. And I am also busy, etc. Nevertheless, it seems like we could work harder at it. Also, most people just want us to agree with them. And I have a sort of nausea about that that comes from doing everything deliberately the wrong way. I mean, 
I'm out here every day banging my brains against the grass and the power plants and the ladybugs and even the remnants of romanticism, which I myself am. So I am attempting to tear myself down in the interest of building a ghost in the machine or finding someone recognizable when vulnerability rears its smashing head and opens its boysenberry heart of miniature Australian shepherds and black and white goats eating oats at Quaker meeting houses. Try not to be overwhelmed. I say to anyone who will listen, be good to yourself. Luxuriate in milk or find a patch of tall grass and crouch down in it. Paint the town green. Paint it with a tiger. Particles of particles of pigments is all. I don't know who painted me into this corner, but their initials are MH. Anyway, the grass is vivid soft. And I bet what surrounds us appreciates our little souls failing to arrive and failing to arrive until the cows come home, except the cows don't come home. And home's a cathedral in a wash of smeary light. And the light is from a source that nobody knows, but that everybody writes home about. It's a paradox for sure and heavy on my mind. My soft boiled brains are wild to escape, but I don't know where else I would go. Just read one more poem. Hope everybody's doing well. This is called Viagra Boys and Shame. Uh, I don't know how many people are uh, know the band Viagra Boys or the band Shame, uh, but here we go. Viagra Boys and Shame. Suddenly... Orange pine needles cover the driveway, and my head's a little softer from the volume of last night's Viagra Boys show at the Woodward on Main. Shame played too, but I'm almost ashamed to say we left before they even went on. My ears were fried and concussed like a medieval bell ringers after Viagra Boys exploded Cincinnati's dumbass light festival and tore my heart to shreds with Ain't No Thief and Punk Rock Loser and Sports. I had forgotten my nicer earplugs again, so I bought some of those squishy orange foam ones at the venue, but they make everything sound muffled, mufflered, muffleted. so of course I took them out during the first song, and the music was glorious, but I'm paying for it today. I'm not sure I can even stand up straight. The tinnitus is so overpowering, my hearing is slayed, but also Viagra boys were just so totally of sleaze and angularity, a meatpacking plant of starry-eyed detonation devices. And I know no one wants to think about calves' livers liquefied and sprayed against the moon, but that's what it was like. And I also know that nobody wants to hear about a show they didn't attend by a band from Sweden with a really stupid name, a band most people have never even heard of. But the craziest thing is that Melanie was with me in the pit for the whole set. And in the 26 years we've been together, that's never happened. Not once, but last night it did. And we were both jumping up and down, blotto and bewildered by the Viagra Boys singer, Sebastian Murphy, and his eyes, which stare out asleep and awake all the time, a little too urgent and a little too drastic. And we were sweating and beer soaked and out of breath, so weirdly happy and alive in our 50s. Maybe I'd had a few too many, or maybe in truth, I had haven't ever had enough. Also, I almost got into a fight with some Viking looking dude who was windmilling everybody, but that's an even less interesting story. So I'll spare you and let Mel tell you how it really was when you talk to her. And if you don't talk to her, you'll be spared forever. You're welcome. To me, stories about shows and near fights are even worse than telling someone a dream where you're peeing in a trough in a barn and feeling sort of icky about it. And then in the dream itself, you wake up in an unfamiliar house with narrow winding staircases and people standing in doorways who you don't know, but you know they are your housemates and you still have to pee. So you go into the bathroom, which is a vertical rectangle with a white tile floor and a drain in the middle. And you think about Lily's 
berries of the valley and mandarin oranges and you start to pee again but the icky feeling comes back and you wake up a second time but now for real and you're in your own house in your own bed and outside it's still dark and nothing's wet so you're relieved in that sense but you still really have to pee and you're singing viagra boys under your breath what a fucking great band you keep thinking as you go pine sap drips in the periphery thank you everybody awesome matt thank you let me uh, just Okay. Last but certainly not least, we have Vicky now reading for us. Uh, v is the author of seven poetry collections and of the short stories collection, A Brief Alphabet of Torture. Winner of the 2016 FC2's Ronald Sukunik Innovative Fiction Prize, the novel Swimming with Dead Stars. Her poetry collection, The Old Philosopher, won the Night Boat Books Prize for Poetry in 2014. Her poetry collection, oops, I'm sorry. Her book, Suicide, The Autoimmune Disorder of the Psyche, is out on 11-11 in spring 2023. The Fall 2019 Fellow at the Black Mountain Institute, her work includes poetry, fiction, film, and cross-genre collaboration. She was the 2022 recipient of the Jim Duggan's PhD Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Prize. Please welcome V. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful first day um, of the resident. I'm going to read uh, from my... I'm going to read from my um, poetry collection, this carcass, one poem. Saliva, Terracade. Your tongue is lightweight, like ceramic tiles, while you lick your lover in order to build a saliva based terracade. You may be Shane. Hendrick, Australian architect, building your cubistic blocks. But Picasso beats you to it without resorting to enzyme, lubrication, bacterial decay, a mucosal refusal, and a submanding bugular glance is simply a glance away. Then I'm gonna read from um, an excerpt from my poetry collection called A Bell Curve is a Pregnant Straight Line. The room is trying hard not to grow flowers from the cement of a skirt. The tulips bloom along the concretes of its foundation. At night, the room inhales the scent of the nightshade family and develops bronchitis the following morning. The scents descend the slippery rope of sidings, sometimes is lung breaking inhaling the afternoon. A dress the size of a football field appears in a man's mouth as he dreams about swallowing an alligator. In the afternoon, the dress in its full regalia crawls back into the river. It lies on the murky marsh, waiting to open its hem jaw, waiting to stalk its prey. By one in the morning, the throat of the dress is filled with blood, limbs, and hair. The dress cannot be worn with milkweed pretending to be parasites. 
The room believes that the medley of aromas of porcupine grass, Sai oak grandma, common evening, primrose, wild parsnip, pericord grass, and alum roots, stationed on the long corridor of the peri, has invaded the western side of its domini dominion. The long stem of the grass hover on the cell. There is no point to being famous. It does not last or to extend immortality. For instance, Robert Frost is simply another name for a chair. And Emily Dickinson is also another name for a type of hairy grass. And then I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel, Swimming with Dead Star. I'm going to read from page 76. Early when she had placed the chicken into the skillet and turned on the stove, she recalled, yes, the Uber driver was very kind to wait for her outside price chopper so she could buy one head of cabbage, a whole pre-smoked and pre-baked chicken, five pounds of enriched white rice, some green onions, one box of mixed nuts and one large pre-baked apple pie. The Uber driver apologized for how long it took her to collect her from the airport. Madone has waited about 20 minutes, which was unusually long. But she didn't mind it. She enjoyed watching people getting in and out of saddles, being collected by family members, Yes, as familiar chivalry still existed, and studying the footsteps of passerby, the way they fell into the ground. She found the steps mesmerizing, observing mundane gestures slow down her mind, and retarded her emotions so that she could not be too quick to adjust her consciousness to a new place. The Airbnb looked like a modern bung bungalow from the 1800s. The siding was painted a light blue, a blue that was darker than the color of the sea. There was a white jet attached to the house. There was a small stair leading to the main entrance of the house. Anyway, if you want to read more, um, you can read it later there. And then I'm going to end my reading with two poems from my poetry collection, War is Not My Mother, uh, which will be out of Clash Books in August of this year, which is in about less than, a, I guess, less than two months. This one is called K9. Lao Tzu. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Watermelon seeds on the vet force me to crack when I open them with my teeth. You stick out your tongue, too scorching to take a nap this afternoon, nonetheless. The splinter mouth of the red seeds winked at me and to toss them out into the sun. They flutter like crimson hummingbirds. The neighbors come running by in green and yellow sandals to witness the watermelon seed transforming into hummingbirds near the shack where a lady grows kookwa and purple mango scenes. The night before the police found a lovely Sitsu with 232 fireflies trapped in the cave of his closed mouth. When he barked, a whole herd of them rushed out of him and they fluttered in the open air. Like a medium sized Pasasinic city made of baby lanterns. They flew over the rice field, the buffaloes, and zip through Aung Tung on the clothesline, 
and above the sugarcane mills and bin, Sebut bin yung, the canisters of fermented plums. Our village is a mutiny of boca, French doors dry mud after a hard rain. As it may, perhaps the barking dog will wake the sleeping giant in all of us, even for a solitary fleeing vestige. I beg that all our, our autumns become like this wild thing, a village ambushed with unexpected beauty, a landscape swarming with life, shuddering our freedom into lanterns. Before we lose our sandals to the monsoons, our women to the Chinese, please don't let us forget there is still one lantern, lantern inside of our canine Lao Tzu. Okay, I will end with a poem called Threshold. The day I stroll along Wing Tate Min Kai, it was in late September, and I noticed a campfire on the torso, the torso of my blue blouse, and another on the stomach. I think I'm that gorgeous. There was an entire era in the second millennium when it was devastating to have campfires in your tops and Kung Tai, but now it is 2018. And I chased after that fashion statement like a dork. There was an absolute tradition of sensationalizing your body that was more Vietnamese than Syrian, except it was Syrian in 2010, while it was striking to be resilient, ravenous refugee who held so much of her own measurement. And she was a fragment of a crusade, as trivial as antiquity, and it bloodlit the campfire in her blouse. It is the inauguration of winter today, and each period has features and flaws through which summer or spring are forced to trickle out, the least impeccable tang of it really in January. Oh, recall once I was a refugee, I seized a white blob of bun bao and stood up from the pond of dumplings near my kneecaps and while bursting from the kernel seams, I marched toward your body where there was unceasing beer Hanoi. By then we were drowning down 333 and the ugly inferno of a drink. Near the threshold, I confided that I came for both of you because you were too delicious to miss. It was inevitable that the children were asleep. It is impossible to know if I won Sid Ban It Jung or Donut, as it appeared that roundness was the influential, defiant thing, me feeling inadequate about everything that wasn't round. I was a segment of an ethos of drunks who gluck in shacks near Lee Tự Trọng Street and slurped down the cruel Saigon beer in the sake on tap and hallucinated about driving you around in a scooter. Those chronicle parasols, I hug beer bottles whenever I go so I can spit haikus of you and them. I must have yu hu dap da hung vị mình tay. There was food in everything I own. I also own two opium dens. I absolutely adored you. Somehow it was never enough, the beginning of my nuance, a resurgent in my nightmares and hallucinations, which my bad no, it was a prey to impart. I was a predictable home to inmates of dementia and sake, though I must say, they behaved more like mistresses than convicts. The virtue of the night is that I didn't stop blinking once. It was the only thing a magic that transpired in Saigon. I locked my cunt in a brothel to block everything else, like my tits were not codependent enough. I don't feel sorry for what I did, even though the entire world hated me. 
the entire world can eat bông thịt nướng and I won't give a fuck. I had a campfire near the back of my purple turtleneck. It was impossible to stop it from sweltering. It grew bigger and bigger. I got used to barbecuing thịt gà with lemongrass on a skewer with it. In the second week of January, it, February, it was impossible to leave my blue hammock. My body jolted awake at ungodly hours and there was fao bong and thet wing yang, wing dang, and I kept on smoking, throwing up and kissing the cheeks of teacups left and right. I couldn't forget the second you put on a red envelope on my palm. It was like your heart on an ashtray. I grew fond of your doorknobs and even fucked them a couple of times lamentably, not afraid to tell Adam where his Adam apple is or how to miss a mark. Though I was told just now that I have missed the mark. I have so many campfires in my closet from all the people and memories I haven't been able to barbecue. I eat one plate of logic and knowledge after another and lamb guy and a newer version of the iPhone seem to be what people are into or care to share with me. But I don't dare forget the manner in which campfires visit my body like an asteroid seeking for the very first time it's home on a planet called my torso thank you v, thank you so much awesome reading thank you let's have one more round of applause for all of our readers alejandro de acosta matt hart and vicky now and tomorrow morning, we will have a lecture from Vicky now. I can't wait. Um, our next um, reading is tomorrow evening with James Hanahan, Pupe Masagi, and Jess Arndt. We'll see you all later.